Get ready to embrace debate. First take starts now. Coming up on the First Take podcast, is Tom Brady just a grumpy old man? Plus, Urban Meyer joins the desk to talk about Aaron Hernandez. And the Panthers' new GM calls out Cam Newton. It's time for him to win. All that more coming up on the First Take podcast. Hold up, say what? Say what? What's wrong with all these haters? They lying, they lying. And I'm a gun, I'm saying. I'm trying to put my partners on, we always gonna be first. A team of all stars, like there's diamonds on my t shirt. Look at all these haters' faces, boy, all they hurt. We winning everything earned, nothing given to us. Repeat champions wanna win, then you gotta go to us. Non debatable, so don't talk to us. Woo. First take, every word great. Direct and produce verse, check out that word play. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to First Take. I'm Carrie Champion, sitting directly across from me. Oh. Skip Bayless, looking good. He has a nice haircut, ladies and gentlemen. Oh. And then Stephen A. Smith joins us from New York. How are you, Stephen? Good morning, y'all. How y'all doing? I like your haircut, too. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank yeah. you. Let's get right to it, guys. We have some great guests from the ESPN College Football Tour. Ohio State head football coach Urban Meyer whoa, will join whoa, the that desk. That's a good get yeah. for us, is it not? Mm -hmm. We also have Nebraska head I'm, football I'm, coach. I'm, 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 yeah. I'm looking forward to talking to Mr. Urban Meyer. And he, you, my friend. Mm -hmm. uh, Bo Pelini will also join yes. us. But first, gentlemen, let's talk about Cam Newton. He is on the clock. Uh, the, pa the new Panthers GM, in fact, Dave Gettleman spoke with the Charlotte Observer saying it's time for Cam Newton to win. The new GM was hired in January and replaced Marty Herney, the GM who actually drafted Newton. Gettleman was asked if Cam is the future for the franchise and he paused for just a few moments and said yes, he is. But now it is time for him to win. Stephen A. from New York, pull out the tea leaves. How do you interpret what the new GM said? Well, what I interpret it as is that, you know what, considering uh, the advent of quarterbacks like a Russell Wilson, a Colin Kaepernick, an RG3, uh, one of the things that all three of them had in common is that they won football games. Uh, despite the, the incredible athleticism and the individual talent that Cam Newton may possess, the reality is he's 13 and 19 as a starter for the Carolina Panthers. Yes, he led the team in rushing last year. Yes, he, won a, he threw 176 straight passes without an interception really cut down on turnovers and protecting the football. There's a lot to be said for that. But at the same time, when you consider the way their defense improved, they leaped by about 18 slots defensively last season. The question about this team obviously is offense. And if there's a question about the offense, it has to evolve around Cam Newton. You've got D'Angelo Williams. You've got Jonathan Stewart. You even got a, a short yardage specialist in Mike Tolbert, you know, in your backfield, coming out of your backfield. So you're perceived to be solid from the running back position. Steve Smith may be 34 years of age, but he had another 1,000-yard receiving season last year, and he's big time. This kid, LaFell, is clearly the number two receiver. we got to see what he's capable of doing. There's no doubt about that. And obviously in Greg Olson, you have uh, the second most reliable uh, pass catcher for Cam Newton at the tight end spot. You have pieces in place to be effective. You have pieces in place to start off better than one and five. And so if you if you are the Carolina Panthers hierarchy, you're looking at some of the elements, the pieces that you have in place on both sides of the ball. And you're saying to yourself, particularly since you ended the season winning five of your last six games, so you could finish seven and nine. We have the pieces in place to get something done to do something, to at least make a run at the playoffs, if not get into the playoffs, to at the very least have a winning record and to show progress, especially with Rivera, the head coach's job being on the line. He doesn't get it done this year. I mean, listen, we know he's gone. It took uh, uh, Richardson, the owner, about six days after the season was over to, to, to announce that he was keeping Rivera on. So he's on the hot seat. The defense is, is, is potentially stout. You've got pieces on the offensive side of the ball. It comes down to Cam Newton. And the new GM was saying it comes down to Cam Newton. He's got to step up and get it done. We know he's got the skills and the talent, but he's got to get it done. So gut feeling, Stephen A. Smith, by year's end, does the new GM decide that he is so long-term on Cam Newton? 
I think so because I think Cam Newton is too much of a big time talent uh, to give up on. This he's entering his third season. I, I'm not giving up on him. I believe that the upside is tremendous. I don't like some of the pouting, uh, but that's about it. I think that the upside is tremendous, and I think Cam Newton's going to show out this year, even though he's got a new offensive coordinator. He sure does, Mike Shula. Not sure that's a big upgrade over Rob Chudzinski, who's now, of course, the head coach. Of I don't think it is. I don't think it is. That's my question mark. My takeaway from yesterday was I was shocked by the response of the new GM to the player we have perceived as the face of this franchise going forward. I thought he said it all, this Gettleman did, without saying a single word for seven endless seconds after the question was asked of him. So Stephen A, he's basically, without saying a word, saying, I have not seen enough. And again, I'm starting to speak for him here, but as you point out, Enough maturity, enough leadership. We've seen the bad body language, the towel over his head, as we've seen on the sideline. We've seen the Superman celebration when they're down a couple touchdowns. I forget when it was. I think it was to your Giants on that Thursday night. We've seen that a couple times. Just these are maturity issues. And I, I've said it before, Stephen A., I thought, in a way, the worst thing that, that Cam could have done was to start off his NFL career with 432 and 422 yards passing. Remember those first two games? Both of them losses. One on the road at Arizona, one to a really good, as you well know, Green Bay team at home. After that, his rookie year, I kept trying to bring some perspective to it and point out he had, after that, only one more game over 300 yards. And then in the final 12 games, everything was in the 200 range. And then last year, very quietly at the end of the year, they actually won four straight games, Atlanta at San Diego, Oakland, and at New Orleans. They won all four games, but Cam didn't throw for over 300 yards in any one of those games. He did rush for 116 at home against Atlanta, which was a big help. My point is, that's the Cam who can win football games, not the 400-yard Cam, the 250-yard Cam. Not make mistakes. Those last four, he had nine touchdowns to only two interceptions. That's the great Cam, using his legs occasionally when need be, that, that can win football games going, going forward. But, but the new GM saying, he just got to win. You pointed out all the pieces that are in place. I like all their pieces. I like their stable of running backs. They added Kenyon Barner to that. It's pretty good. Okay, now it falls so on I, I agree. the yeah, face of franchise. Mr. Newton, you're on. I think your GM just put you on notice for this year. You're, you're on this clock. Starting off, and we're about well, to talk about the Seahawks. By the way, they open at home against those Seattle Seahawks. Here we go. You got to do it. Got to win well, games. Let's, let's, put it, let's put it in perspective. When he, when he says he's on a high seat, it's not like, oh, my goodness, if Cam Newton doesn't get it done this year, he's going to be traded. Let's, let's put it in perspective. What he's doing is highlighting the responsibility and the onus that's going to be placed on the shoulders of Cam Newton. You don't get to just sit there and look at the team and say the team is so-so. We got to do X, Y, and Z and act as if you're somewhat absolved from guilt, blame, etc. No, you're the face of the franchise. You're the quarterback. We believe we have the requisite pieces around you for you to be better than what you have been. So I'm putting the spotlight on you. It's not like I'm worried about Cam Newton getting traded. I'm just saying that based on what the GM said, he's essentially saying that if we falter this year, we're going to step aside and let this dude handle this hot seat. He's not getting a pass because yeah. he no longer has his rookie year or just being a second-year player to hide behind. Not when Colin Kaepernick, Russell Wilson, and RG3 have stepped onto the scene as youngsters, younger than Cam Newton, who have handled their business. He's not getting that pass anymore. That's what I interpreted as, as the GM said. Okay, I, I hear you. I do believe in Cam. I stand by what I said before his, he was drafted wasn't completely sold on his accuracy or his maturity at Auburn. But I am sold on the talent. And I think this could be a, if, if I can in a third year, I think this could be a breakout, breakthrough kind of year for Cam Newton. I also think it must be that kind of year. You say, well, he's not going to be traded. 
I don't know what would happen if they have a long, hard year and he struggles, and he struggles with his maturity and handling losing, or if they just lose games and he doesn't come up big in fourth quarters, which we've seen before. I don't know, Stephen A. They might look under a new GM to go in a new direction. I, I'm not sure about that. I think this is a pivotal year for him in Cam Newton's career. All right, let's do this then. Cam Newton has to win. The Seahawks' ability to win in the NFC West may have taken a hit. Percy Harvin received a second opinion on a hip surgery, and it was decided, guess what, folks? He needs surgery. Harvin tweeted last night, when everything is going good sometimes, life throws you a curveball. Sorry to have to report that my injury will require surgery. Nobody was more anxious and excited about season than me. But I will be back stronger as ever. I appreciate all the love and prayers. 12th man. Shout out to the fans there. Harvin missed seven games. It's an interesting note. Last year, while he sprained his ankle playing against his current team, the Seahawks, uh, he's expected to be out three to four months. Skip, I'll start with you first. How big a blow is this? Stephen A., th this is a huge blow to the Seattle Seahawks' chances to get to the Super Bowl. If, if that's how we're evaluating them as the team on the verge, it's a terrible blow, both psychologically and strategically. And obviously, Percy Harvin would have brought some lightning to that offense it did not have last year. He could have been the difference maker on offense. And now, God help him, we're not sure when he'll be back. And I must throw in Stephen A., and I know you share the, the, the sentiment on this. This young man is so gifted, and he just can't stay healthy. It's always something. It's the ankle. It's the migraine. It's always something with him. Seattle plunged on this, bet some significant draft picks on this, and now he's not going to be there for we're not sure how long, but he could miss the whole season. That's why I said you weren't here on Friday, but I made the statement that, to me, off this Percy Harvin news that became official yesterday that he will have surgery, I think Seattle is the team most likely not to live up to expectations this year. Mm. And in that division, the team that will shock to me is Arizona. I think they're on the rise under Bruce Arians. We saw him at the ESPYs. So I think that this is going to be a new day for the Seahawks. I love their defense. I respect it. That, that, that's got to be the biggest, baddest secondary in pro football, the best secondary in pro football. They added Cliff Averill. But I'm not sure they're going to be able to live up to the expectations now of teams going up to Seattle where they crushed everybody and went 8-0 thinking, oh, we got to be ready for this game because I think Seattle took a lot of teams by surprise in Seattle, especially earlier, Dallas, New England. I think this will be a new world for Pete Carroll and company, and I'm not sure they're going to be able to live up to it, the, these expectations, without Percy Harvin. Well, listen, I think this is a devastating blow, but when you talk about how they're not going to live up to expectations, my question would be, what specifically are the expectations? If the expectation is a Super Bowl, I agree with you. If the expectation is a decent 10 or 11 win season, a berth in the playoffs, possibly a trip to the NFC Championship game. I still think the jury's still out on that, Skip. I think this defense is elite. They were number one last year. They added Chris Averill, uh, Cliff Averill. Uh, they, we know what their secondary is made of. We know how they can, they can rush the passer. Uh, I, I like their defense. It's clearly elite. It's big time. And obviously, they're usually energized. And that sixth man, the home field advantage that they have in Seattle, I think goes a long way. Surprise or no surprise. I think it's incredibly difficult for anybody to go up there and deal with it, okay? But the reality is, is that Percy Harvin was supposed to elevate their offense to another stratosphere. Yeah. And now he's not there. And now you're forced to rely on Golden Tate and Sidney Rice again. And I'm not sure about that. We all know Marshawn Lynch and what he could do. And I expect him to continue to be himself. Even rush for another 1,500 yards. I think Russell Wilson is going to be even better this year than he was last year. I think the kid's got a lot of promise. I believe in him. And I think he can get it done. But at the same time, you need that big play dude. That game breaker. That was the difference. That's why they did all they could to get Percy Hoffman. And the fact that he's not there, I think, makes them vulnerable to Atlanta again. I think it definitely makes them vulnerable to San Francisco. Those are the two teams I think you've got to watch out for in the NFC. Uh, i got to see Green Bay's defense in order to believe that they're in the mix as well because the bad man that Aaron Rodgers is, he can't do it all by himself. 
But I definitely believe that offensively, Seattle's going to still be a little bit challenged without Percy Harvin. And as a result of that, I think it's going to cost them a trip to the Super Bowl. I disagree with two statements you made. I do not believe that Russell Wilson will be even better than he was last year. Really? Not seeing it. Wow. Mm -hmm. I do not think Marshawn Lynch will be even better as he gets to be an older and older running back who's taken an awful lot of punishment. Not sure about that. Golden Tate, can he be the go-to receiver? Now they're, they're saying that Sidney Rice is over, where is it, in, in Switzerland, Switzerland yeah, to trying to get his procedure. knee. Yeah, oh, good luck with that. Yeah. So I don't know. I think they're going to struggle to score points this year. They'll have to lean completely on the defense. And I say advantage 49ers as we speak. Wow. You booked it already? Season hasn't started. Well, I, 49ers are going to win that division. No, no, no. I, I mean, I, I definitely think San Francisco has the edge, but – um, I, I think you underestimate some of those other pieces on Seattle. I believe in them overall. I think they're a quality football team. I think we've got to give Pete Carroll credit where credit is due, not just for his coaching ability and his innovative ways, but more importantly, his ability to motivate his players to maximize their potential. I got to give. I, I just got to believe in them on that level. It's just that again, to get over that hump. You need a Percy Harvin. There is no question in my mind with this Seattle roster, yep. you need a Percy Harvin. And without him, I don't see you beating Atlanta or San Francisco. MDA, we're talking Mike D'Antoni, folks, speaking on ESPN LA radio for the first time since Dwight Howard left and is now presumably settled in Houston. The Lakers head coach admits he still does not understand why Howard left. Everybody's going to make that decision, and uh, you can debate it all you want. Only Dwight knows. Uh, obviously, he didn't think he was as happy as here as he will be in, in Houston. That might be the case, and he had to make that decision. But uh, there will be a lot of speculation. He tried it. didn't work out, and we go forward. Uh, so be it. And it's hard for me to sit here and criticize or even even understand why he left Uh a place like L.A., that's, that's, that's kind of mind-boggling a little bit, but that's, that's in his DNA and what he wants to do. That's in his DNA, and that's what he wants to do. Stephen A., are you surprised by what Dan Tony just said? <sighs> Maybe so, a little bit. I'm, I'm looking for the word skip, carry. It, it just escapes me. I don't know, but it, it you know... Maybe mind-boggling is a better way to put it. Okay. What do you mean you don't understand, you don't know? And one of the things that resonated with me about what came out of Mike D'Antoni's mouth is the first sentence, and I'm reading it just like we just heard what he had to say. I'm reading it on ESPNLA.com. It says, it's hard for me to sit here and criticize or to even understand why he left a place like L.A. That's part of the problem. L.A. knows it's L.A. And you believe and assume that everybody is going to stay, that you don't have to coax and you don't have to conjole and you don't have to pacify. Now, that's not to say that you should have to go to extreme measures like the Los Angeles Lakers did in terms of putting up billboards saying, please stay or just stay rather with Dwight Howard's face on it or anything like that. But if you're Mike D'Antoni, you knew he was approaching free agency. OK. Now, if you're Jim Buss, first of all, you knew he wanted Phil Jackson. You hired Mike D'Antoni. You're Mike D'Antoni near the tail end of the season. You walked around with this attitude like you coach, I coach, you play. And Dwight Howard is saying throw the ball inside. Everything can't be pushing the ball up the floor. We're kind of old here. It may not work to our advantage. And he was essentially ignored pretty much until Kobe went down. And when Kobe went down, you had no choice but to feed the ball inside and go that way. And I'm not saying that there weren't modifications that didn't take place, that Mike D'Antoni didn't make any effort whatsoever to try to modify his game plan and his schemes and, and just his way of doing things. But there is no doubt, according to many, many people familiar with this situation, that Mike D'Antoni was relatively dismissive and somewhat aloof towards Dwight Howard's pending free agency. So clearly when you make a statement like why you don't know why anybody would leave, want to leave a place like L.A., you assumed it was the Lakers. It was purple and gold. 
It was the franchise with 16 world championships. And it was Hollywood, La La. Who would want to leave here? And as a result of that, you didn't put forth the effort necessary to, to really do what you were supposed to do to, keep, to make sure that this was a place Dwight Howard wanted to stay in. That's not all that happened. It's not all Mike D'Antoni's fault or anything like that. I'm just using a statement, Skip, that when you have that kind of attitude that it's L.A., we're L.A., look at who we are and where we are, it speaks to the level of arrogance that I've been talking about with this franchise for months, which is why they look like they're going this way instead of this way. Mm -hmm. I hear what you're saying, but that wasn't my takeaway. The two words that struck me, and I did not hear the entire interview, I heard those, what we heard, and then I read all the quotes as you did on ESPNLA.com. But the two words that struck me were oblivious and denial, or some combination thereof. It's as if D'Antoni has no idea what happened last year. <laughs> Like it didn't happen. He was speaking about Dwight as if Dwight was trying to decide as a free agent between the Lakers and the Rockets. Well, he chose the Rockets, and I can't figure out why. He was there for you last year. He played for you, yeah. D'Antoni. Don't you remember what happened? Don't you remember the issues he had with you? Can you not take any blame or, or even credit for the way you coached Dwight last year? Wouldn't that be a big factor in why he chose to leave beyond being Lakers versus Rockets? It's D'Antoni versus McHale. And then what about Kobe? And again, maybe I didn't hear the whole interview, but can't you deal with some of the Kobe issue here? That Dwight obviously wasn't comfortable with sharing the stage and the basketball with Kobe and obviously to me wasn't comfortable with committing long term to being the man who would have to replace Kobe Bryant when he finally retires as the new face of the Laker franchise. Those are the issues. And, and Dan Tony comes across as if this just happened yesterday and Dwight didn't play last year for the Lakers. And then well, he just dismisses Dwight as he's one of the better centers in the league. <laughs> what? He's one of? He I mean, by there. default, I think he's become the best one, unless you want to make the Hibbert case, and you can certainly try that. But without Bynum in the mix, I don't know. It's just, it's like he says, it's mind-boggling to me. Why would it be mind-boggling? You should know better than anyone why he chose to leave, right? Help me out here, Stephen A. I don't get it. Well, that's what, but that's what I'm trying to say to you. I mean, the, the word, you use the word oblivious, but, but it, it, you know, I use the word culpability as in absence of. It's like you take no responsibility for anything that's happened. It's like, you know, you, you have to understand, Mike D'Antoni appears to be the kind of coach that I just coach. It's mm -hmm. like in today's day and age, you know, it's, it's not about recruiting. It's not about making this a place where people will want to play. Mm -hmm. It's not about cultivating relationships and whatever. Outside of Steve Nash, who can definitively say they have a relationship? with Mike D'Antoni. I'm not saying he doesn't. I'm saying I don't know anybody other than Steve Nash. But see, I don't know. Help me out. It's almost like, you know, anybody, and, and listen, it wouldn't be bad. You could sit there and say, all right, so be it. The man yeah. did average 58 wins a season in Phoenix. But the problem is every other coach, even the great Phil Jackson, even the great Doc Rivers, even the great Greg Popovich, all of them, at some point in time or another, had to develop a reputation a as having a relationship with its elite players. That was the M.O. But that Stephen was a, the criteria wait, to some degree. Let me ask you this question. You say that he has a dismissive attitude. Now, is that just in general? Like you said, I, I find it kind of interesting that he still, as you said, mind-boggling, won't admit that he was there. Is that just his attitude in general, being dismissive? Let me tell you something. Anybody that talks to Mike D'Antoni, Skip, Kerry, Stu's one of the nicest guys you'd ever encounter. Incredibly respe respectful, very, very nice, and, and just seems to be the most relaxed, easily approachable individuals you'd ever find. But when it comes to coaching and the players who play for him, there are very few players I have encountered 
in all the years I've known of Mike D'Antoni coaching in the NBA, I've encountered one player, one, that stands up and literally gloats about his relationship with Mike D'Antoni, the coach, and that is Steve Nash. I have never encountered any other player. They don't speak negatively about him, yeah. but whether it's Amari, it's Joe Johnson, oh, Kobe. it's Kobe, it's Kobe the list of Sean Marion, the, the list goes on and on. Yeah. They don't say it. They don't say it. And Steve They a, don't say it. What was Steve Nash in Phoenix? He was an extension of Mike D'Antoni on the floor, right? He was Steve D'Antoni. That's his relationship with D'Antoni because Nash was part of building the mystique of D'Antoni. And D'Antoni comes across to me, this isn't like to your original point, this isn't about we're the Lakers and Houston's not. It comes across to me that I'm Mike D'Antoni. Oh. How dare him not want to play for Mike D'Antoni? Yeah, we tried it last year. And you didn't make him part of your offense, coach. Now, again, is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's, it's a thing. It happened. Like you said, it took Kobe going down before Dwight got the ball. Well, then how can you blame the man for saying, I want to play for one of the, the better big men who ever played the low post in Kevin McHale. I want to go to where Hakeem the Dream lives in Houston, all those good things that we talked about with the Rockets. Mm -hmm. Well, D'Antoni to me just comes across as, as sort of arrogantly oblivious. I'm Mike D'Antoni. Well put. Arrogantly oblivious. Thank all right, you. let's leave it there. That was good. Day five at camp caught Tom Brady schooling the rookies on what he wants, using words we clearly cannot because this is a family channel. But it is interesting to note, Brady recently told the Boston Globe, quote, I don't want to be a grumpy old guy. I understand there's a learning curve and there's a patience. I think you try to let them know, though, that there is an urgency about it. So it's not like you can afford mistakes. Well, he may not want to be a grumpy old guy, but he does want it right. We're putting Brady on the hook. Uh, good or bad sign that he said this, Skip Bayless? Stephen A. Smith, this is a great sign <laughs> for the New England Patriots that Tom Brady's not only a grumpy older man, I think he's flat out angry. I think he's driven to make something out of what people are saying is nothing now in New England. He also said recently that he's at his best when he plays angry, when he's almost unhinged, because that's when he's hyper-focused. I think he's hyper-focused early in training camp, far be before the, the, even the opening exhibition game. And obviously he has a lot of new young receivers to work with. Obviously New England has rarely, if ever, had much luck drafting young receivers. But this Aaron Dobson out of Marshall, the second rounder, I think he can play, and I think Brady's going to turn him into a player sooner rather than later. I think he's going to have to contribute early on, and I believe that he will. And I'm going to also note for you, Stephen A., that rarely have I heard Belichick and Brady rave about a player the way they are already raving about Danny Amendola, the new Wes Welker. The, clearly the knock on him is he just hasn't been able to stay healthy through his first four years in the league. But he did play for Josh McDaniels, as you well know, in St. Louis where Josh is the coordinator. And I think he, we, obviously he's been the star of early camp. I think he's going to be even better than Welker because I think he'll be a better deep threat than Welker was at this stage of his career. So I like everything I am hearing out of New England, and I think New England's going to surprise some people with how good it is, how quickly. First of all, try to stay on the subject. I know it's difficult <laughs> for you when it comes to the New England Patriots because you have absolutely no objectivity whatsoever. We did, know that this I? is a team that, that, mm -hmm. that, that led the league in points, averaged over 34 points, in yards over 427 a game. They dropped 59 on the Indianapolis Colts. We well, know all of this about <laughs> them. The point of the matter is, is that when it comes to Tom Brady getting on youngsters, again, this is what you want to see. He's a veteran. He's a three-time Super Bowl champion. He's a guy that's been to five Super Bowls. He's universally recognized as one of the greatest quarterbacks to have ever played this game. And now that Tom, you know Aaron Hernandez is gone, uh, uh, you know Rob Gronkowski is out, and we don't know when he'll be back. Wes Welk is gone, and you got a new guy in Danny Amendola. The fact of the matter is, is that you've got basically a bunch of novices running around 
as it pertains to the New England Patriots system. And so what Tom Brady is doing is sort of like it, it, it's, it's almost like a boot camp. Like you're coming in there and he's showing you this is the way that things are done. We don't walk around here with a laissez-faire attitude. We don't walk around here thinking we've arrived because we're the New England Patriots expecting success. We don't take it for granted. We're great because we treat every, se every season as its own individual component. Last year means nothing now. That's not going to carry us through. But we are who we are. This is our, our identity. We don't take things for granted. We don't play games. We don't mess around. We do what it is that we do. And I think that any time you've got a great quarterback who is accomplished, that walks in from day one with that kind of mentality, it shows you why the New England Patriots have been who they've been over the better part, over the last decade, really, because you have a leader like Tom Brady showcasing not just his skills, but his leadership in doing what he does. I think that's what it's all about. And I think that that's what we, wish, we should see from every single quarterback in the NFL. They should be having this attitude from day one. Because if your quarterback is nonchalant, then that is the kind of stuff that can have a contagious detrimental effect on the rest of the team. You cannot have that. So do you agree with me that New England's going to be better than most people think, even without Aaron Hernandez? Interesting. I don't believe that, Skip, because I don't think that people think the New England Patriots are going to fall off the map just because of everything that's happened. Everybody that I've spoken to has said they have Bill Belichick, they have Tom Brady. Somehow, some way, they'll figure it out. So, again, it's one thing to sit there and say they had Super Bowl aspirations, and now they don't. So that's your definition of falling off the map. But to me, I still predicted that they're going to win the, N the AFC East, and so has everyone else. We believe they're going to be in the playoffs, and we believe because of Tom Brady and Bill Belichick, they have the potential to make noise. I don't think that's assuming they're going to fall off the map. So I don't agree with you on that. Mm. Okay. Are you ready to book it that they will not win the AFC this year? Mm. No. It depends. Uh -oh. I mean, Ben Roethlisberger, is he going to stay healthy? Mm -hmm. if ben Roethlisberger, is he going to stay healthy? I would sit there and say that, that look at what happened with Baltimore. I don't trust Cincinnati and the Indianapolis Colts, even though I like Andrew Luck. They're Keep still going. relatively young. <laughs> to me, the only team standing in their way are the Denver Broncos. Mm -hmm. And again, if you look at the New England Patriots, can you definitively rule them out if all they need is one game, meaning yep. one team standing in their way? If the AFC was stronger, I would feel differently. But by default alone, I can't book that the New England Patriots are not going to make the Super Bowl. Look at the AFC. Nothing's etched in stone with these guys. You got them winning the AFC, Skip? At this moment, depending on injuries, as you say, but if you hold me to it right here, right now, I have New England beating Denver in the AFC wow. championship game in Foxborough. In Foxborough. You're feeling it this morning. Okay, I'm just, and, if I'm you, just being and you honest. put my feet, and if you put my feet to the fire, if you put my feet to the fire, I would pick Denver in the AFC Championship game to beat New England because I believe that Denver will have home field advantage and they won't lose two years in a row in Mile High City. In Mile High City. Okay. See, would you pick them in Denver? No, I would not. Okay. But I think because of that division that New England plays in, Stephen A., I think they could, the New England, even without Aaron Hernandez, maybe without Gronk, I still think they can sweep this, this division. All right. Let's and the add, schedule's easy enough that they can, I, I think they could win, heck, 13 games. All right, and that would give them home field. Add this note, Tom Brady looking in to break in uh, four new receivers. That fifth one, Gronk, not playing. The ESPN magazine cover story, The Trouble with Johnny. Take a look at it, folks. A sit-down interview with his parents reveal how concerned they are about their son and how he's dealing with his newfound fame. His father says, quote, it's one night away from the phone ringing and he's in jail. And you know what? You know what he's going to say? It's better than all the pressure I've been under. This is better than that. He's in the wilderness of his own bad decisions right now. Wright Thompson, the uh, author of the article here, says from the Manziel's perspective, everyone from Sumlin to the school to the NCAA seem to care deeply, even profoundly about helping him through just a little bit less than they care about helping themselves. 
His father went on to say, quote, it's starting to get under our skin. They're so selfish. We talked about this yesterday. Both you and Stephen A. Uh, said that you had some concerns about Johnny Manziel. After reading the article in its entirety, Skip, are you even more concerned? Stephen A., I did have more time after our show yesterday to sit down and read Wright Thompson's stunning piece from top to the very bottom. And I was horrified, horrified by what I read. And you know how much I care about this kid both on and off the field as a person and a quarterback. And I'll be the first to tell you once again, I disqualify myself if I should, that I tend to overreact to excessive drinking of alcohol because of my family background, what I grew up in. But there is reference after reference after reference in Wright Thompson's piece about Johnny Manziel at age 20 drinking not only beer but hard liquor, mixed drinks, sometimes even in front of his parents. And as we did mention yesterday, it goes into more detail about after his arrest of about a year and a month ago in which the police report that I carefully read portrayed Johnny as very drunk that night that he got into the fight that got him arrested. After that, that a and I think, in concert with the parents, had Johnny in an alcohol pro, not, not really a program, but with an alcohol counselor for about eight months. Apparently that has stopped now. And the father goes so far in the piece as to suggest that Johnny is drinking more now just to deal with his celebrity, not with his football. That the parents can't wait for football to start so that Johnny is in more of a structured football environment. And it leads us now to wonder if his early exit from the Manning camp that we hashed and rehashed was in part caused by a long night on Bourbon Street on that Saturday night in question leading to the Sunday morning oversleeping and departure from the camp. Stephen A., all I can tell you is this scares me to death. And if there is the start, even the hint of a problem here, I pray that the parents or the school can help Johnny deal with this potential problem going forward. Because once it gets a hold of you, as you well know, Stephen A., it's hard to declaw that potential disease of alcoholism. <clears throat> well, obviously, you know, you, uh, you know, being kind enough and open enough to tell us about your family background on numerous occasions, you would definitely know about that stuff. So I applaud your courage and willingness to do so. I think that one thing that we have to keep in mind, first of all, Skip, is let's take a moment to applaud uh, Johnny Manziel's father, Paul. I mean, he, he spoke up. Uh, he's been open about his concern for his son. And when I read the article, what I took away from it is that he's trying to save his son's life. Yep. And he's basically saying, I'm going to do what I can. I need all the help that I can get. And if it means Johnny getting mad at me or whatever the case may be, so be it. He talked about them on a the golf course and how he dreads when Johnny <laughs> wants to play golf yeah. because he sees his temper when things don't go right. Uh, that's a very, very telling little tidbit there. It tells a lot. It tells us a lot. Again, I've met Johnny Football on three occasions. We went out to dinner in South Beach when he came on the show to surprise you in San Antonio when he came on at the ESPYs. I find him to be a highly intelligent young man, uh, somebody that I think that to some degree has gotten a bad rap because I think that too much stuff is highlighted, and I think it's other people trying to impose their will upon him. Yep. And I think that has that has added to the pressure that he feels. The dude wants to be able to live according to his standards and not other people's. And when you impose yourself upon him in some way, he feels imposed upon and he acts out. I think that's something that we could surmise from all of that, the celebrity and how he tends to react to things. But let's also keep in mind what he's dealing with. Yes, he's a Heisman Trophy winner, but shove that aside. He's an elite football player in collegiate football. He's a guy that grew up in affluence because his granddad, you know, made a lot of money in the oil business. Yep. And his father obviously has benefited in a, in a, in a, to a great deal. He had a black Mercedes Benz. 
which his father didn't want to get him, but he had begged his father for it numerous times. So his father finally tried to get, he tried, decided to give it to him. Somebody keyed his bend, yeah. you know. So everywhere you turn, when you see these details, what you're learning is that he's not just being allowed to be a football player. He's not just being held to an elevated standard, but he's being confronted by real tangible resentment. And he's the kind of dude that seems to be aching for a fight and frustrated by the fact that he can't fight back because if he does, it's going to be frowned upon. And I think that to some degree assists in him acting out as well. Yep. In the end, Skip, what we're to take from all of this is that he still needs to grow up, which he knows and everybody else knows. But he's not the bad kid that some have tried to paint him out to no. be. But he just has to be cognizant of what he does, how he does it, etc. We have to take into account what his dad said and what the story, uh, w- w- uh, you know, portrayed and how alcohol is a potential problem there. And the, the conclusion that I've drawn, Skip, is that this year is going to make or break Johnny football. Mm-hmm. He has to get through this year unscathed. It's going to be harder for him this year. I'm not talking about the football season. I'm talking about the year, meaning after the football season's over, not just during the football season. He has to get beyond this year and get to the NFL because the NFL season is longer. There are more business-style commitments that have to be honored. And there is a czar in Commissioner Roger Goodell who doesn't need his father's permission, won't look for it, and don't have to and does not have to worry about alumni members appeasing them, that is, to deal with what he feels he needs to deal with if Johnny Football impugns the integrity of the NFL in any way. I think the NFL will benefit him more than anything, but he's got to get to that point, and it's going to be at least a year before he's able to do it. And that's why I think if we're going to be concerned about anything, it's about this year. Yep. I, don't th- I think beyond he'll be fine. Mm. <sighs> well said. I liked your phrase of acting out. I think that operates here. I think the, the two frat parties over the weekend at the arch rival school, Austin, University of Texas, acting out. It's what you said, Stephen A. Watch this. You don't think I can get away? I- I'll do this. Now, I hope that his better judgment isn't diluted by the consumption of alcohol. I, I don't know if that was alcohol fuel, that bravado to walk into a frat party last Friday night in Austin, Texas, at University of Texas. But Stephen A, big picture, I hear you. I, I hope Johnny is hearing us. I think he I think he likes us, I think he believes in us, I think he trusts our opinions. We welcome him back on this show and I hope we're hitting home. I fear we're not, because I think people much larger than us have tried to to talk a little reason to Johnny, and I'm not sure his ears are open just yet. Well, I don't think it's about his ears. That's the whole thing. I think it's that ultimately he goes away from them and he's confronted by these other things. Now, he's got to con- make a concerted effort to avoid stuff like the frat parties and that kind of stuff, no doubt. But when you listen to what his father said and what his parents are concerned about, according to the piece, that speaks to the celebrity. Like one of his teachers, he's on a golf course and she comes up to him and, 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 you know, runs up to him. And she's got this big smile on his face and he has a smile on his face, thinks that he's being confronted by somebody who's a teacher, an acquaintance, somebody he knows, he's a friend, etc. And she says, could you sign Sign my hat? hat. And he's like, are you serious? And and, and the minute minute he realizes she wants him to sign the hat, his whole complexion changes. You know why it changed, Skip? Because at that moment in time, and I'm not denigrating the teacher in any way, because she may not know better, but at that moment in time, he's saying, here's yet somebody else that wants something from me. Yeah. And any time you're in the eye mm-hmm. of the you're in you're in the eye of celebrity. Yep. I mean, even on a far lesser scale, me, you, Kerry, everybody, people that work at ESPN and others. If you are in if you are considered remotely to be a celebrity everywhere you turn, someone wants something. And that's for us. Mm-hmm. So imagine 
how it is for him. Mm -hmm. It's a lot tougher to deal with, man. And, and in his case, it's a lot tougher to escape from because he's still in college. Exactly. That's his problem. The teacher still wants to call him Jonathan, what he was called as he was growing up. And the piece ends with Wright Thompson using the quote from Johnny saying to his dad, don't call me Jonathan anymore. He wants to be Johnny Football. I, I just hope he can handle being Johnny Football. The trouble with Johnny, true life lesson. Yeah. Running out of time. Need a few more. Stephen A. Smith. I have to say that it's been incredulous being here today. <laughs> I understand the copious notes that you take and understand. Do you think he was always like that when he was a kid? <laughs> He's like, Miss Krabappa, I have to say that I completely, utterly, and quadrilaterally deny pulling uh, 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 Cecilia Adams' pigtails in this situation. <laughs> <laughs> He did the stutter and the stam. That's funny, Stephen A. Oh, man, Frank Caliendo is hilarious. We are very, very lucky to have him. He kills me, but I'm telling y'all right now, mark my words on this. Go back to his imitation of me as a, as a movie critic. Uh, for for what, 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 Les Mis, whatever. I mean, I, I'm trying to tell y'all right now, it's, it's one of the most hilarious things I've ever seen. He is hysterical. So Trust me on that. So I have to ask, was Stephen A. Smith... Like Stephen A. Smith when he was in third grade? No. <laughs> Remember, I got left back in the fourth grade. Oh. So clearly I was not. I, I, I cl Clearly I, ha I had a lot to work on in terms of my vocabulary, <laughs> my writing Which skills, everything, why... reading, comprehension, etc., etc. <laughs> Which is why yes. you're so fabulous now. Now, you shouldn't have said that. As you see, uh, Did... Skip Bayless is putting you on the couch. You, he now knows something more about you. I know too much. I have nothing to hide. It's not, it's, 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 it's not where I was. It's where I am, and it's where I'm at. Talk about it. Here we go. Well, let's talk about some baseball. About As that? the baseball world awaits the expected suspension that is looming for superstar Alex Rodriguez, the Yankees' third baseman told Sports Illustrated that he wants to be a role model. Quote, I want to be a role model. I have two daughters at home, and I'm sensitive to that. And above all, I want to be a role model, continue to be a role model, especially to my girl. So all the noise sometimes gets on my nerves, but that's it. I can't let it get any further than that. I have a job to do. A-Rod wants to be a role model. So listen, if that's what he wants to do, how should he handle Major League Baseball's investigation into his alleged involvement, Stephen A., with biogenesis? You know something? That depends on the level of guilt. I think that he should fight a lifetime ban come hella high water. Uh, but if indeed he has used performance enhancing drugs uh, for the sake of the game, uh, for the sake of what little reputation he'll have left, um, I think that he should be an anti Ryan Braun. He shouldn't hide like a wuss and disappear, uh, planning on returning uh, uh, next season to collect the rest of the money that he hoodwinked the Milwaukee Brewers into giving him a couple of years ago. I think A Rod should stand up. He should accept the suspension, assuming he's guilty. He should accept a suspension, but one that will allow him to come back to the game and try to make amends. But he should still step up and accept the suspension nevertheless and be very, very open about uh, what he did wrong and, and incredibly contrite and apologetic. It's really that simple. If you're going to bring up your two daughters and talk about how you want to be a role model, well, accountability culpability that flows with it if you're not if you're willing to duck and weave and hide even in the face of what is perceived to be insurmountable evidence again if he's innocent that's entirely different but if he's guilty and he knows he's guilty and it's not a lifetime ban we're talking about i think you accept the punishment i think you stand up and acknowledge what you did wrong uh you make sure the cameras are rolling when you express your contrition because ultimately, years from now, those two lovely, wonderful daughters of his that he brought up in that Sports Illustrated article are going to have a vision to attach to attach or look to when it comes to their father. And you don't want that visual to be provided by others. You want it to be provided by daddy. Even if he's wrong, you want to see your daddy standing up and saying, this is what I did. I'm sorry as opposed to people like me, Skip, or the numerous number of pundits out there and commentators who are going to have something to say about it. Okay, but you say anti-Ryan Braun. 
Remember, Ryan Braun was the first one just to step right up and say, I, I did it. You got me. Uh, what kind of deal? We can don't I know get what here? he did. Well, but, but we That's do right. know that we, he got busted. And he said, yeah, you caught me red handed. Now, how do I get out of this the quickest, easiest way? I just I just rat on this guy at Biogenesis. I say, yeah, he gave me the stuff. He's guilty. And then you disappear and you start over next year to earn the rest of your up to $133 million left on your deal. Well, if we're talking about role model, now you've muddied this water. Because we did have, you weren't here on Friday, but we talked about Pete Rose, who, who says he's very close with A-Rod, but he was really tough on A-Rod, kind of putting A-Rod on his couch, saying, you know, what he should do is just fess up, stand up, face the music, face the cameras, face the, the crossfire of the media, and just say, you got me, I was wrong again, I did it a second time, and I apologize, and, and I take the full extent of MLB's punishment here. That's what Pete Rose said to do. Well, that's one role model way to do it. There's also another way, for your daughter's sake, and I do not advocate this, but sometimes it works, and that is to flat out lie your way out of this situation. Either he's in complete and utter denial here, or he's just going to lie t until he can't lie anymore. Because we continue to read reports that the mountain of evidence against A-Rod is far beyond what they even had on Ryan Braun. But A-Rod, through uh, people you've talked to around him, Cornwell, his, his uh, chief advisor, his lawyer, they're just saying, he did nothing. He did nothing wrong. You've got it all wrong, MLB. He is completely innocent. We're going to fight it until we can't fight anymore. Well, that's one way. What if you can beat the system? I don't know. Can he? I doubt it. But what if he does? Well... The pro well, again, I understand where you're coming from, and I, I'm, I'm not poo-pooing that. I'm simply saying, Skip, that we're talking about a visual here, and we address this subject by asking this question in light of what he had said in the Sports Illustrated article about being a role model and bringing up his two daughters. Without that, of course, you sit there and you fight to the finish. I'm not advocating that Alex Rodriguez watch the show, get up, and admit his guilt. I'm saying... If you are going to do what Ryan Braun did and acknowledge that you're guilty to Major League Baseball, don't just acknowledge it to them and quietly and then skip out of the scene like a thief in the night okay. and disappear until your suspension is over. I'm saying if you're going to admit it, meaning you're going to acquiesce to MLB's demands that you acknowledge your guilt and avoid appealing and avoid arbitration and all of that and just go away. I'm saying if you're A-Rod and you're bringing up your daughters and you're talking about being a role model, don't just disappear. I'm saying stand up, look in front of the cameras to whomever you choose to talk to, the horde of media or whatever the case may be, and acknowledge exactly what you did and make sure that you are contrite and apologetic because let me tell you something, if you do that and your ultimate point is to be that inspiration and role model to your daughters. That's going to go a long way, a longer way with them, seeing you in that sympathetic state, dare I say, rather than disappearing, hiding, and having pundits all over the baseball world and the sports world speak for you, or in this case, against you, chiding you, and just giving derogatory and incendiary comments your way, and your children have to grow up listening to that without ever hearing a word from you in your own defense in a public forum. That's what I'm saying. Stephen A., if today, tomorrow, A-Rod comes forward and says, you got me, mm -hmm. I apologize, I did it. This would be his second mm -hmm. bust. This would be the second time he would have to face the world and say, I'm sorry, I use PEDs. This would be another time that he would have to answer to other charges that could include, that we continue to read about, reports saying that they, they have evidence that he obstructed the justice, the, in, the inter, interfered with the investigation. What if that comes to light? Then A-Rod could go down as the face of the steroid era. He, he could be the biggest loser ever in the steroid era. And even beyond will. Yeah, even beyond Manny Ramirez, yeah. who was a two-time loser. But, but again, but again, you're talking about us, you're talking about the public at large. 
I'm saying that's different from the role model slash father of two daughters that he brought up. I'm saying for their sake, you don't want to leave yourself at the mercy of pundits alone Mm -hmm. are, you know, elocuting a position on you. You want your child to see you trying to defend yourself or being contrite and apologetic enough not to try. All right, let's leave it there, guys. Um, While the Yankees try to escape the bad uh, press and save their season, the Red Sox extend theirs with a major move. Red Sox acquire Jake Peavy in a three-team deal from the White Sox. The Red Sox currently have a half game behind uh, the Rays in AL East and have an eight-game lead on the Yankees. And, Stephen A., I'm not asking this question to be funny. You already know this came up in the morning meeting. Do you believe this trade ends the Yankees' hopes? And I'm saying that seriously, as sincere as possible. I'm not making fun of your Yankees. I am. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I'm, I, I, listen, you know what? Both of y'all could kick rocks. I don't believe either one of y'all. I don't believe I, I don't believe this show. I think this show is right with a bunch of Benedict Arnolds uh-huh. who root for Boston every chance they get. Mm-hmm. We know that the Yankees have been a shell of themselves. 75% of their infield has been out along with Curtis Granderson. They can't hit home runs. I was shocked when Lyle Overbay hit a home run last night. Uh, I, I was stunned. I couldn't believe it happened. It's a miracle to see something going over the fence with the Yankees this year. But clearly, PV is an upgrade. He's a legitimate number two starter in any rotation for a contender. I was listening to Tim Kirkchin talk to Mike and Mike about that this morning. I don't like the fact that his ERA is over four. I don't think that makes him spectacular. But for some reason in today's day and age, that's better than solid in the eyes of baseball aficionados. In the end, what it comes down to is this. PV makes them better. It was a move the Boston Red Sox had to make if they were going to try to stay on par with the Tampa Bay Rays, who are just balling right now. Mm -hmm. And if you've got the Rays and the Boston Red Sox balling the way that they're balling, that doesn't leave any room for the Yankees. So it is what it is. The Yankees are not going to the postseason. Wow. I still think what? that Joe Girardi has done a July fantastic 31st. job. But th- they got to be able to hit. They got to be able to hit, Skip. You hear what and you And if said? you don't have guys healthy, if, if A-Rod's out, <laughs> Teixeira's out, Jeter's just coming back, we don't know if Grandison's come back. You went and got Soriano. <laughs> uh, it's still a shot. See? But right now, it's, I'm not going to write them off totally, mm-hmm. but I must acknowledge no. Wait a minute. that injuries have really decimated them. <laughs> Wait, they're not going to the playoffs, but you're what not going to write them off totally? They're Which not is going it? To the postseason, but he won't I'm write not, them off. I'm, listen, I don't believe it, but I'm not going to definitively state their season is done just yet. Okay. I'm still holding out hope. Oh, yeah. I'm just humble enough to acknowledge yeah. oh, you? it really isn't yeah. looking good <laughs> you're right now. <laughs> It yeah, really is a good right now. He is being humble. Good for you, Stephen A. Acknowledging what the truth is. But that, the words did spill it's not right looking out good of his right mouth. Now. Looking good. The Yankees are not going to the playoffs. Said Stephen A. Smith, Post-season. who then reconsidered. Well, I'm not going to write him off. Uh, Stephen A. I just don't want. I just. I, I don't want to accept that. It's August. <laughs> I don't want to accept that. The cold, I don't want to accept that. Reality. But I'm on the verge. It's over for your Yankees uh, this year. I'm sorry. Even with Derek Jeter, oh boy, it is over. Oh boy, even oh with boy. the presence of the gray one. At, how old's Jeter now? Forty. He's not. Seven? Boy, get no, out I'm here. sorry. I, whatever he is now. Come on, Stephen A. It's <laughs> over and done. Red Sox prevail again, as I predicted. And again, Red Sox got big issues, big injury issues back into their bullpen. They got Buckholtz injury issues. They got Ryan Dempster injury issues. And they're still hanging in there with the Rays, who have the best starting pitching easily in all of baseball, featuring David Price from Vanderbilt University. The point here is that your Yankees have now faded to three and a half games out of the second wild card, only four games over 500, and only, would you believe it, on the eve of August, the New York Yankees are only a game and a half ahead of the Kansas City Royals? Oh, goodness. It has come to this? Oh, my God. The Royals are on the heels of the Yankees? The Royals are on the heels oh. of the Yankees. And where is CC Sabathia when you need him, <laughs> as I always call him? 
can't count on Sabathia. CC can't count You're on Sabathia. So I'm rubbing it in. I'm rubbing oh it in. Oh my goodness, Stephen yeah. A. Where is Andy Pettit at age 49 a., don't when you take need this. him most? Stephen Where a., is he? Do not take this, Stephen A. Where is Tell Phil him. Hughes, that phenom that he was supposed Tell to be? Him. Okay, I'm ready. Go. <sighs> He has yeah. nothing. I he has know. no I, I, comeback. I, I, I have. Yeah. My Yankees have not. Yeah. They, 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 they just, they can't hit, man. They can't hit. They can't I mean, hit. What, what do you want me to say? They can't pitch. You can't, I mean, CeCe uh. Sabathia, first of all, CeCe Sabathia will get it together. Don't ever disrespect him by saying that about him again. Can't count. Don't do that. Mm -hmm. CeCe Sabathia, well, but I can't help it if Phil Hughes hasn't shown up, if Andy Pettit is old, I, even though he pitched well last night. I mean, what you want me to say, man? They can't hit, man. El Capitan right is 39 now. years old, point of order, Skip Bayless. We know that. <laughs> I know that. He's going to get a first down and more. Oh, my goodness. What a spectacular run for Tanner Martinez. You won't see a better individual play than that one right there. Takes off, middle of the field. The race is on. Touchdown, Taylor Martinez. 92 yards. Corner in the end zone. Come on. Touchdown, Nebraska. Our next guest is just the third coach in Nebraska history to win nine games in each of his first five seasons. We welcome in Nebraska head coach Bo Pelini to the desk. Thank you so much for joining us. This is your first time at ESPN, and the very first show you're doing is First Take. It is. It's a little <laughs> nerve-wracking. I mean, what a way to introduce someone, huh? And you said yeah. to me during the break, how do I take all the yelling? Uh, it's actually music to my ears. It so is. are you ready to participate? She, she can handle it. I, do. I sit there. Yeah, I sit there when I work out, and I got the first take on, and I sit there and I listen to Skip and Stephen A. <laughs> screaming at each other every day. It's uh -huh. a, you know, it breaks up my day in a good way. It breaks up your day in a good way. So it feels familiar. Uh, well, Skip, well, go ahead. Well, by the way, speaking of emotions. <laughs> you, you, you occasionally have had a hard time controlling yours on the sideline, which I must admit, I enjoy watching. I, I will tune into Nebraska games just to watch you coach. Now, you're a very good football coach in and of yourself, but have there been times, we're seeing some of the video now, when you've looked at video of yourself, and is it fair to say you cringe occasionally at, wow, I, I, I almost lost it there, I did lose it there? You know, I've gotten better over the years. Yeah. You, know, you, you kind of you grow into it, mm -hmm. and you you learn how to you know channel your emotions the right way. You know, it, it's <laughs> you, you can't change who you are and the the passion you know and and you know the the emotion that comes with it, your personality and all that. But you know, you grow into it, and you learn how to channel it in the right direction, and you know, you, you grow into the position. You know, and uh, um, I've been fortunate. You know that uh, you know you. Coach Osborne, you know, helped me a lot, a lot as far as in my first couple of years as a head coach. Coach, is there an excessive amount of pressure that comes with you trying to channel it in the right direction, considering the day and age we live in, you know, social media, everything gets, you know, cameras are everywhere. That added pressure being that with the spotlight, such an excessive, such an extreme spotlight being placed on coaches, not just players on a collegiate level. Is it, you know, does that make, does that make you sort of modified or try to modify it a little bit? Is that an extra incentive? You know, I, I think it's just a realization knowing that you, you got to live your life Really, you know, on the sideline, really, and off the field, like you always got to figure if some of the cameras on you, mm. and you know, you 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 have to know that that, uh, and you know, with the political correctness that's out there and all the things that are going on, you know, things that maybe were acceptable, you know, six, seven, eight years ago, it isn't the way it is in this day and age, and you you, you know, you can sit there and fight it or you can accept it and understand it. That's the that's the world we live in right now, and that. Uh, you know, you just got to watch yourself at all times, and and you know, you got to channel it in the right direction. You know, and you know, I'm one that you know holds my guys, my players accountable, and and uh, you know, I think there's a time when a kid needs a good talking to, but mm. you know, you, the reality of it is, that if you if you do it in such a way that somebody doesn't like it, then you know you're going to hear about it. So you, you just got to understand that you, you know you're the face of the program, and in some cases, the face of, of a university, and you got to keep that in mind all the time. Speaking of that, we've talked and talked on this show about Johnny Menzel. You have a Johnny football in his own right in Taylor Martinez. Make a case for us that Taylor could have an even better year than Johnny has this year. 
Well, you know, I, you know, it's it's interesting. Taylor's been around on the scene now, going on his fourth year as a starter, and um, seems like he's been around forever. You know, <laughs> and and but you know, he's played a lot of football. He, he's come a long way to some extent. You know, Taylor made a huge jump from his sophomore to his junior year. I mean, not even close as far as his his technique, everything he's doing. The throwing he, football. Become a great football player. Yeah. We all knew he could put the ball on the ground and yeah, put yeah. the ball in the end zone in a hurry. But the way he threw last year, his accuracy, uh, he came a long way. And uh, if he takes that kind of jump that I expect him to take between his junior and senior year, you know, he can do it all. I mean, I you know, I think that... Uh, Unfortunately, there are some people out there in, in the media and some critics and stuff who still see him as the quarterback he was two and three years ago, and that just isn't the case. He he came a long way, and if he becomes more efficient, which I think is what makes a quarterback great, and as far as letting the offense come to him rather than trying to sc- sc- make a scoring play every time he, he gets under center, then I think that he'll make the jump necessary to... to Go into that elite and, level. And if he does, could you see him in the Heisman race? I don't see why not. I mean, it, it all comes down to whether we're able to to, to win enough football right. games. Because you know that with winning comes, you know, that's where the that's when the individual awards happen. All right, Bo Pelini, thank Coach, you. Coach, so I'm wondering yeah. as you, you watch. Go ahead. Yeah, Steve. one more question, Coach. I'm watch. I'm wondering as you watch Taylor Martinez run the football. The guy rushed for 1,019 yards last season. Whether it's Johnny Manziel, whether it's on a pro level with an RG3, a Colin Kaepernick, a Russell Wilson, some of the things that we've seen them do, do you do you think the kind of stuff we witnessed last year is also going to help Taylor Martinez, I mean, really, really perform even better this time around? Because his game seems to fit that kind of mold is what I'm asking. Yeah, you know, I think Taylor's come along at the right time. You know, that's kind of the way the – that's the way it's going in sport, and for, you know, not just college football, but in, in the NFL. And you know, Taylor fits that mode. And I think that what people are seeing about Taylor now is that we all know what he can do. I mean, he he's his, he'll break records when he when he gets to the combine as far as running the forty and showing what you, he can do with so? his legs. Oh yeah, yeah he's Flat, fast. Like what? Fast. Four. He's four three. Three. Okay. He, he's fast, fast, and. Uh, you know, but what he's showing, he has the arm strength and he has the talent to, to really make any throw as there is out there. And I think if he as he continues to grow and he just continues to work in his decision making, people are going to see he's a uh, he can go a long way as a quarterback. And I, you know, I think people there's always that debate: is he an NFL quarterback? I coached in that league for nine she years did. and I have a pretty good understanding of what it takes. And and there's no question in my mind he's going to play at the NFL. Really? Oh, yeah. interesting. All right, Bo Pelini, well head done. coach at Nebraska. Thank you so much. Let's go over this really quickly. Practice is Monday, so good luck with that. I'm looking at your schedule. You have Wyoming, first game, Southern Miss, then UCLA. UCLA, you're afraid, huh? UCLA is, uh, you know, we, we went out there last uh-huh. year and uh, handled it. Didn't uh, mm-hmm. didn't didn't finish the way we wanted to, so we're looking forward to the Bruins coming in. She, but they're a good football team. She's UCLA, so she's trying to set you up here. So. Mm. Yeah, you know. It's okay. Yeah. Both, he's cool with it. Yeah. He understands. He and yeah. I go way back to yesterday. Part of the deal. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Enjoy your time. You did great. It should be fun here on the campus. Well, back in 2003, Romo turned down a $20,000 contract in Denver to sign for a $10,000 contract just in name, Dallas. Right? Yeah, just Romo. Oh, just Romo. Just Romo. Okay. Will you make that kind of money? <laughs> After Tony Romo signed his $108 million contract, 55 of that guaranteed, he's in the $50 million Mm -hmm. loan, he received a text from former coach Bill Parcells saying, quote, I was just wondering if coming to Dallas had worked out for you. Just wondering. Perhaps a little sarcasm there. Yeah, a little. Skip, were you surprised by this? (laughs) Stephen A., I I can't say I was surprised by it because I think Coach Parcells is bragging just a little bit like, Mm -hmm. hey, Tony, didn't, didn't I tell you this would be the right move, even though Denver offered you twice as much money as an undrafted free agent, 20000 to 10000 Now you're in that $50 million club, Tony. Here's my takeaway. I'm not so sure that Tony believes in the big picture he made the right choice. Who wouldn't want to be the quarterback of America's team and make... 50, what, is, what did you say it was? 55, 50, 55 guaranteed million dollars. Mm-hmm. I'm never sure that Tony Romo is happy because, as we all know, money will not buy happiness. Maybe you can rent happiness, but Romo never looks that happy to me because 
This is the hottest seat in the NFL, thanks to the great Roger Staubach and to Troy Aikman and all those Super Bowls that came before. And you constantly talk about the dearth of playoff victories, one in however many years it's been now. And I think there's still a lot of undrafted free agent in Tony Romo's psyche. Like, I think he looks around from Sunday to Sunday and says, am I really this good? Should I be here making all this kind of money now? Because I still don't believe Tony Romo believes he can make the throw to win the game that vaults the Dallas Cowboys to the Super Bowl that we all think that they deserve to be in at some point pretty soon. I, I'm not sure I would want to be in Tony Romo's shoes going forward. You can say, yeah, you got all that money. Really? Really? Does that make you happy? Not sure about it. Um. I'm sorry. $108 million would make I a lot, you would lot say of people that. happy. I was yeah, 50, I 50, 50, 55 million in guaranteed yeah, dollars yeah, would yeah, make yeah. a lot of people I'd happy. Let me tell you that right now. Yeah. That, that, that's number then one. Then you got to live up that's to it. That's number one. Oh, yeah, I understand that. And that's where the depression kicks in. Mm -hmm. Because when you've got one playoff victory on your resume in eight years, you have no reason to be walking around smiling. So I applaud Tony Romo for being as transparent as he is, walking around looking a bit, uh, you know, disconsolate, yep. disappointed, demoralized, yep. depressed, dejected, all yep. of this other stuff, because there's no reason for him to look nor feel otherwise. Yep. This is what happens when you don't get it done. It's just that simple. But I will say this, in all fairness to Tony Romo, he is a big time talent. He has accomplished a lot. You're the one quick to point out how he's this undrafted rookie and all of this other stuff and look what he's accomplished in his career. Now he's happily married, he's got a wonderful family. He's making money and Big D, that money goes a long way in a, in, in, a, in a city like Dallas, a state like Texas, with no state income taxes. He's living quite nicely, high on the hog, as they say. Ultimately, he's got to get it done, and he's got to step up and validate that level of faith that, you know, Jerry Jones has given in him. But instead of pointing the finger at Tony Romo like I always do, I'm going to look at Jerry Jones, more so than ever before. And here's why. Because after you gave him the money, now you said he'll be in the film room more. He'll be exhibiting Peyton Manning type tendencies. He'll be he'll be more integral in the offense. He'll have more say. He'll do all. These are all things that should have occurred before you paid the man the money. So clearly mm -hmm. he was given a pass to some degree by Jerry Jones. I'm not going to blame Jerry. I'm not going to blame Tony Romo for that. As a matter of fact, I'm here to make some news for you. I'm going to leave Tony Romo alone and just judge him by what I see on Sundays. Because everything else that has been associated with Tony Romo, it's Jerry Jones that has given this man a pass. You showed me that by the contract you gave him and what you required him to do after you gave him the money, when everybody else in NFL history had to do that before they got the money. True. I'm going to hold Jerry Jones accountable for that, and I'm going to lay off for Tony Romo, and I'm going to look at the big man on campus in Big D. Okay. That's Jerry Jones. You'll do that. Do you think Cowboy Nation will do that? Do you think most of the media will do that? Let's just say Dallas misses the playoffs the next two years with a healthy Tony Romo. Who will take the brunt of the criticism? I'm sorry. No. No. You're not understanding me. You're not understanding me. I'm saying I will hold Tony Romo accountable from this day forward about what he does on Sundays, not the past. And I think the Dallas Cowboy fans are doing just that. I think when you look at the past, we have to hold Jerry Jones accountable because clearly you let him get away with all of these lackadaisical tendencies. I'm not saying that about Tony Romo. I'm saying Jerry Jones said that about Tony Romo. That's my issue. So I'm going to look at Jerry Jones and hold him accountable for that. I will look at Tony Romo and judge him on his performance moving forward. I'm not going to judge him on a pass because clearly he was allowed to exhibit a dereliction of duty yep. because he still ended up getting paid anyway. If, if Dallas misses the playoffs the next two years, Tony Romo will be That's miserably, different. miserably rich. That's what he'll be. But Stephen like A., you well, can be able agree to walk the $55 million make the would make you smile, right, Stephen A.? Fifty-five million would make you smile. Oh, it make me smile. Uh huh. It make me smile. Not this It'd man. It make me smile. Uh, bet, you bet the house on that. Hey, me too. But this man is above it all to my left. He's all. He's above it all. I, I don't have of to play course. quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys. Money doesn't mean.
Money doesn't mean anything to Skip <laughs> when he's driving around in his limo. Uh-huh. Doesn't mean anything to him. <laughs> He did not just but, say but that. But see, I live up to it, though. I have to back it up. Whoa, you were seven, huh? Mm-hmm. New head man, Urban Meyer. So much talk, so much buzz. Going for the end zone. It is. Oh, did he catch it? Yes. Touchdown, Devin Smith. The catch of the year. Braxton looks to the sideline. Beautiful throw and a touchdown. Devin Smith. They can sense it now here in Columbus. And Urban Meyer, in his first season as head coach at Ohio State, leads the Buckeyes to their sixth perfect season. It will go down as one of the great teams in Ohio State history. You just heard it. Uh, In his first season at Ohio State, our next guest led the Buckeyes to just their sixth perfect season in school history. Prior to that, he won two national championships at Florida, and he coached a quarterback that you may have heard of. His name is Tim Tebow, I think. That's correct, mm, right? Tebow. That guy? Uh, we welcome to the desk, Urban Meyer. How are you? I'm doing good and good to be with you. It's good to have you here. There's just never anything to ask Urban about. Never. So <laughs> I will start with the latest news. We need you to please expand upon this. But obviously, case was closed on your tailback, Carlos Hyde. No charges pursued, yet you suspended him three games for what you called conduct not representative of your your program and your university? Well, I first uh, heard like everyone else. Uh, then I heard conflicting stories. And then I spoke with actually the police afterwards. And they said an average, you know, just not an average, but a normal person, there's nothing there. There's no charges to be filed. However, our guys, when I saw the video, he needs to walk away from that situation. And we're taught over and over and over again um, to get away, get out of that situation. That's not, you're a high profile guy, you represent an incredible institution, you have, uh, uh, that's, that's nothing you need to be part of, get out of there. So that's why he was suspended. Is there any wrong place, wrong time involved? Everything mm-hmm. about that situation mm-hmm. was wrong uh, when you watch the video. The, the beginning is very harmless, but then get out, and he started to. That's what's the most disappointing thing is, uh, you know, police officers, they deal with 30 to 40 of those a week. <laughs> However, not a football player. Don't nope. do that and get out of there. So that's why. Coach, uh, f- first of all, I appreciate that explanation, and thanks for enlightening us because there's, we certainly weren't aware that you actually saw a video, et cetera, et cetera. But let me move on beyond that to a bigger point that you had uh, that was associated with your name as it pertains to how you want to impose discipline on your program. Uh, according to a couple of reports, anything associated with, uh, I, I, if I'm remembering correctly, it was talking about as it pertains to young ladies, women in college. I mean, just the mere accusation of doing something wrong, guys are going to be held accountable. It was almost like a guilty until proven innocent kind of thing going on. And I wanted you to elaborate on that because the reports that came out, it threw me aback. As a guy raised by women, I could definitely be sensitive to that and appreciate it. But as a guy that went into college, I can also see where guys might find themselves in the situation where they could get falsely accused about some things. And I wanted you to elaborate on your thinking in regards to that kind of stuff. Well, I, I give credit. You know, I, I was raised in a house that's not acceptable. And I still got some old fashioned uh, values about that. And I, and I explain it. The, the thing is, Stephen, about our players are told that I'd say thousands of times that there are certain areas not to go, and that's one of them. That's if you get charged with something, you're dismissed immediately. No phone calls, no group hugs, nothing, you're done. (laughs) Um, If you are in a situation, you're suspended immediately, and then I want to hear the story, and I just think that's different than typical college nonsense. When you start dealing with, uh, uh, when I see and hear some of the things that go on today, I, I I don't understand that, and I'm certainly not, if I'm in a position as a head football coach, that they're not going to play for us. Uh, and if the police would have came back and said that he was charged, that the, the, the player would no longer be with Ohio State. Hmm. Coach, speaking of charge, yeah, speaking of charge, skip, skip, mm-hmm. skip a lot. I mean, just speaking of charges, coach, uh, one of the things that I, I guess it could be perceived as me being critical uh, of you. I didn't see it that way. I thought it was me being complimentary uh, in, in the aftermath of the Aaron Hernandez arrest. Uh, I I thought that I would have loved to have heard your voice sooner. I would have loved to have heard you speak more extensively than you did on your feelings in regards to that. But more importantly, what took me aback was your wife, Shelly, and your daughter, Gigi, if I'm pronouncing her name correctly, uh, going on Twitter and speaking on your behalf. And I was saying to myself, 
why does anybody need to speak on Urban Meyer's behalf? He's done nothing wrong. He's an exceptional coach. He teaches the right values. He wins. I saw no reason why anybody should feel the need to come to your defense about anything uh, based on what I had to say and what other people were saying about you in the aftermath of Aaron Hernandez's arrest. Is there anything that you would like to add, anything that you would like to explain in regards to how you elected to speak on that matter? Well, we have a very close family, and I had a little conversation with him after the fact because I don't get involved with the social media, and I did hear it as well. And, and uh, But I, I get it. You know, your daughter's, some things are being said. And, and when you take a position of leadership, which we all have in some way, when you're held accountable for other people's behavior, if you're held accountable for your own behavior, absolutely, that's the way it is. You know, you do something wrong, you face your punishment. What's difficult is when you're held accountable for someone else's behavior, even when it's years after you've uh, coached them. But that's... I mean, I'm the one that decided to be a coach, and that's part of the, 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 the responsibility of being a coach. So uh, this particular incident is sickening. This particular incident is, is, is beyond comprehension. So I, at first I was taken aback like most, and uh, obviously uh, there's an investigation still going on, but th- this will be in my mind the rest of my career. You know, anytime mm-hmm. you deal with any recruit, any, mm-hmm. any situation, it's... It's in the back of your mind, and you, you know, could you have done more? I don't, I don't know. But to say you don't think about it, it's every day. Yeah. So, did anything in his behavior at Florida indicate that this was remotely possible? No, no. Th- no. This incident, this, yes. absolutely not. I mean, I'm not even sure how you comprehend that. Um, no. And. As I recall, I think you instituted the All-American Bricks at Florida. Wasn't that in your program? And, and now they have already removed Aaron Hernandez's brick. How do you feel about that? Well, I think it's a lot like what the New England Patriots did. And, uh, you, know, you want to disassociate yourself. Uh, Florida is an incredible. New England Patriots are incredible. You know, the one, one of the winningest of all time. The University of Florida, incredible university with incredible people. They want to separate themselves. So uh, I... I would imagine something like that was going to happen. Coach, let me get to Ohio State because obviously you're fresh off of a perfect season. You did an absolutely fabulous job. I I, I knew you'd be successful. I didn't think you'd be perfect, but you pulled it off. Uh, I mean, how how do you describe – I mean, how were you able to pull off the job that you did last year, and what are your expectations for this upcoming season in light of what you achieved last year? It seems like it it can't get any better, that's for sure. At least it seems that way. No, the older you get, you realize the value of leadership. And and, um, to say 10 years ago I really appreciated leadership like I do now, uh, I'd say 12 months ago I didn't appreciate it like I do now. We had a team that started the season, if you would ask me, September 20th, I said, you're looking, I did. I talked to him, you're, you're staring straight down a 7-5 and five season. We're not very good. Uh, we're not playing very hard. We just have to go recruit and get this thing going. And then something really magical happened, probably as refreshing two months as I've ever had. I saw a group of players take over the team. I saw a group of leaders that say, enough's enough. Ohio State, they lost seven the year before. We're not, this is not what we're doing. And we, we had a couple conversations as a staff and players about the players, when the players evaluate, they're not playing. You either play or you evaluate. And our kids weren't bad guys, but they were certainly evaluating, why are we doing this? Why are we practicing so hard? Why are Tuesdays like this? And when you do that, you're not playing. And then, I mean, our staff and players, you talk about clicking and hitting it right, right at the right time. Well, that team went from being a team that was 7-5 and five to by the end of the year was, could probably compete with most teams, if not every team in America. Wow. You have a supremely talented quarterback in Braxton Miller who – effectively wound up playing in the shadows of Johnny Football, obviously the reigning Heisman winner, and he's dominated the offseason headlines. Compare and contrast Braxton with Johnny on the field, just on the field. You know, I've not seen Johnny play very much. I can compare him to maybe a Tim or an Alex, the guys that I've worked with. Uh, he's the, the one thing that I'm not sure everybody's aware of, he's the most humble big-time athlete I've ever been around. Ever. I mean, he, hi- he doesn't hide, but he is so into... You know, I heard Jadavian Clowney, someone made a comment that he doesn't go out at night because he doesn't want stuff. Braxton, the same way. Braxton stays away, and it's really cool to be around a guy like that. And, and now his work ethic wasn't where it needed to be because mm-hmm. he's so good, so gifted that he was Big Ten Player of the Year, and he was not a great, player, a great mm-hmm. quarterback last year. So he has taken his game, his concentration, his motivation to a, a new level, and I, I can't wait. I mean, we started out as fourth. I can't wait to see what's going to drag out on the field because it's different than it was a year ago. Wow. 
how would you project Coach, him as a pro skip. quarterback? Hang on one second. Oh, he has it all. So yeah. he, he, what he doesn't have is complete grasp of the game. What he has is, you know, about the throw. He's not a great thrower as far as when you say throwing the ball, protection, understand it, protection, understand where all five guys are. He's not there yet, but as far as release, arm strength, footwork, he's got it all. He can play NFL quarterback. Yeah. Go ahead, Stephen A. Coach, Skip Skip Bayless didn't ask you this question. I'm going to put myself on the hot seat, Coach, because <laughs> uh -oh. if there's one person in this world that I can imagine who loves Tim Tebow more than Skip Bayless, it would happen to be you. Now, I'm of the mindset. I just want to I want to I want to fend myself. I want to protect myself here just a little bit, Coach. Tim Tebow is a good kid, great kid. He's at the it factor. He's a winner. He belongs in the NFL. I just don't think he can throw, Coach. And is it wrong for me to say that, sir? I mean, feel free. I will throw myself at the mercy of your court. <laughs> is it wrong for me to say that? Jeez, Tim Tebow, this is, I'm not sure people are aware of this. He is the second most efficient passer ever to play college football. Skip Sam Bayless Bradford, is aware I, of that. I know. That. Sam Bradford's number one. He's number two. Uh, people say he's a system quarterback. The good thing is in the National Football League right now, there are a handful or even more than a handful of systems that Tim can certainly play quarterback in. Can he play in traditional West Coast offense? I've never coached it. Uh, I, I can only speak to what he can do. And so, Stephen, I really believe that, you know, I've, I've studied the 49ers. We studied the Seahawks. We studied the Carolina Panthers and RG3. Mm -hmm. The style of systems that are now entering the National Football League, can Tim Tebow do that? There's no question he did it. He did it in the SEC conference at a probably like it's never been done before. And obviously the SEC are dealing with all, almost all NFL mm -hmm. players and anyways. Urban, you might be biased, but do you believe that he should be a starting quarterback right now in the NFL? I, I don't. I can't say right now. I think he needs to learn the game in the NFL. I think he's at the perfect place. He's behind, our, obviously, the best coach in the, in, the, in the National Football League, maybe in all of pro sports. Okay. And behind, most importantly, he's behind Tom Brady. Tom Brady's going to teach him how to play yes. quarterback. Because NFL is much different in college. College is mm -hmm. much different in high school. And so he had the luxury. He came hey. to Florida, and he was behind Chris Leak. People don't remember that. We won a national championship with Chris Leak oh, okay. and Tim Tebow rolling in there a little bit. So I think he's in the perfect place. Stay in the background, learn the game, and then go take over. Well said. See, Coach? Coach, coach, I agree with that. Okay. One thousand percent. I agree you, with you that. You do coach. not agree That's, with yes, that. Coach. Don't start that. Hold it, Don't coach, lie to this man. Coach Urban Meyer. Coach, no, I would never lie. <laughs> coach Urban Meyer, I have said that the man needed to be a backup. He needed to learn the game. Mm -hmm. Skip Bayless has been saying he should be starting. He could win on this level. Leave him be. Throw him to the wolves. I said he's with Tom Brady and Bill Belichick. Talk to me in about three years, and I'm willing to. I'm willing that to. That has been his argument. Skip. That has not been. He has <laughs> steadfastly maintained that he cannot throw. Oh, and please! If you cannot throw. I said you he cannot can't throw. start in the National Football League. Gentlemen, you cannot argue this right I, now I, in front of the coach because he is getting ready to go. Coach Urban Meyer, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, some civility you brought to the yeah, desk. You did. Amazingly. You calmed us down. You calmed us yes, down. Yes, you did, Coach. And yeah. you and you end the show with Coach, us. I'm going to be nice about Tebow. Okay. I'm going to be thank nice you. about Tebow from now on, Meanwhile, Coach, just because of you. Just I'm because of you. For the next two days, I'm going to the National Association of Black Journalists, where Jamel Hill is being honored. So I want to let you guys know that. We should give Stephen A., make sure you give your props to uh, Jamel Hill, because I'll be gone for the next two days. You'll be sad. You'll miss me. She's one of the best. She's one of the best. She deserves it. Be I'll, be I'll be what? Can I see it on TV? Hey, no, you cannot. You're always on TV. Hey, That's no, all no it's do. not on television. Yeah. See what I get? You see what I have to deal with all day? I'm, I'm a witness. Uh, how do you feel about that? <laughs> I'm just glad to witness it in person. I yeah. watch a lot on TV. All right, Urban Meyer, thank you so much for joining us. Um, meanwhile, Stephen A., what's your schedule for the next couple of days? Oh, I'll be on air, you know, but I'm, I've got I've got to travel a lot, so who knows where I'll be next? But I will be on the air tomorrow on First Take and Friday. Yes, I in house will. is what we're asking. I don't know yet. No, I'll All get right. back to you, Coach. Great luck we're done. next year. We'll see you. We later. enjoyed it. Bye -bye. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Stephen. Coach, thank okay, you so go. much. It's Take a pleasure. Care. Thanks for listening to the podcast. You can catch First Take Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. Eastern, 7 Pacific on ESPN2.